All right, welcome to the show. We got Slim in the Cut, repping Sacrilege Set Music Group. And they have a show that's going to be out soon. You can be, get your tickets. Tell us about that show and who's going to be in there. Yeah, so uh, just freshly announced today. Um, so me and Grim Sleeper are, um, as like collectively Sacrilege Set are hosting this show. It's going to be called Havoc on the Lake. Um, it's going to be, it's going to have performances from Patrick's tombstone. They're the headliners. Um, and then me and Grimm and then Bobby Yaga, who's a younger, darker trap artist and uh butcher main who also runs his own merch line, uh, run the cash. Um, so there'll be uh merch tables there with vendors set up so you can buy merch there. Um, so yeah, if you're in the, the Cleveland area or even just in the Ohio area, definitely, uh, consider coming out because uh we're gonna have a good time got a lot of cool music lined up i've been kind of like gathering the uh the set list and everything over the last couple weeks so yeah these next couple weeks it's going to be a lot of finalizing stuff um yeah i'm really excited about it it's uh it's a lot of like the first show for a lot of these artists like me included so it'll be a fun experience to kind of you know feel out how to do it and everything what what tracks you plan on performing? So I'm gonna be. I'll give away a couple. I won't give away all of them just to make it a little bit of a, a surprise. Um, but I, so I'm gonna be doing uh, Cavern Kings. Uh, it's a track I did with 420 Shinobi. It's actually not on my page, um, but it's on a tape that we did. And then I'm gonna end my set or like my tracks with uh, with Creepa. That track uh, produced by Bonus Sparks and Creepy Man. Shout out to them. They go hard. Um, but yeah, so the, the format of our show is going to be a little bit different than what an average show. Like, we don't have sets. Like, it's not going to be like like my set and Grimm's set. What we're doing is, um, so it's kind of like uh, how shows in the underground kind of used to go back in the day. Like, the Sesh Hollow Water Boys kind of like format where like, like all the artists are up on stage and each person is just kind of like, like doing a song and then we'll rotate through. So like after I perform, then Butch Mayo perform, then Yaga, and then we'll all kind of like, like cycle through. We'll kind of be like, you know, like a showcase in a way. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different of a format than a, a standard show, but I feel like that's kind of, kind of cool. Cause I haven't really seen that done in a while. It was actually Grimm's idea. So yeah, shout out Grim. I thought that was a pretty good idea to do it that way. Did, did have you have you been to a Seth show or or like have you do you know someone like like have you been to like a Bones or Wolf show before? Yeah, so I haven't seen uh, Bones or Wolf, but I have seen Suicide Boys. Um, back when they did like the Grade A tour, with there was like, oh my god, there was probably like seven or eight acts that night. Like the show started at like seven, and I don't think we got out of there till like close to midnight or something there were so many acts like it started off with trash talk which is like a metal band or like a metal like rock band and then um i'm trying to think of who else was there it was like Shakewell, germ uh Shakewell. um yeah yeah Bro, oh, he was on the new ramirez joint oh my stacked. god yeah it was a stacked lineup um yeah if you look up grade a i think it was like 2018 or something like that um yeah like denzel curry was there um damn i yeah, can't uh, blank it now but there, it was there was a lot of uh there was a lot of sick artists there apparently yeah. like the suicide boys make a lot of bread from their shows and also like oh, the in-person no meetups yeah. like and i'm not like saying that like the main source of revenue low-key besides their merch yeah like um oh city morgue was there they were sick they went hard that was i'd love, kind of love to see them like get their like, like what you say city morgue they get bucked bro that was a kind of like before i knew who they were but they're like trap metal like they they were kind of like i don't know they kind of put trap metal on low-key like i feel like it, it was like a thing before but i feel like at least for me i didn't really know a whole lot of like what that was until yeah. i heard city morgue and i was like oh shit they go hard you know what really pissed me off about them i showed um i showed one of my favorite tracks of theirs that joint was called all shit by zillicami and like, oh, oh shit, we come to the t- oh, oh shit. Nonsense. Yeah, right, so I showed yeah, that yeah. to someone and they're like That sounds like six nine. Ooh. Oh yeah. Well, 
you know uh who the other guy uh so it's zillikami and sosmula yeah but they were like uh, the brain zillikami was the brains behind Z like uh six nine yeah right, right right yeah so um i don't know how you say his name i don't know if it's sosmula or sos mula or whatever his name is he kind of sounds like six nine low key and that's i low key i thought it was the first time i heard city morgue and I was like, so this is how Six Nine came up? Like he was doing City Morgue shit, and then yeah, bro, yeah, and but like Zillicami's funny though. Different. Like zillicami has <laughs> got way more character, in my opinion, than yeah, for sure. I think Sos Mula is a little bit more tapped into like the rap game. Like I think he does like more features and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but yeah, you're right, Zillicami, Like I think I joined his live like once, and he was just like in his room, just like chilling, and there was like three thousand people watching him, and <laughs> just like. Yeah, and, like, he would like, uh, like bring people on live just to like make them do shit, like, like do some, do something crazy. So did Ramirez. So did Ramirez. He brought me he on his live. He does that too. Yeah, it's just like they like to entertain themselves by getting three thousand people to watch them. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, like, and uh, are you familiar with Wecking Ball? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I think you you did a interview with him recently, right? Yeah, but he's like a big like skater youtuber and like guy like on instagram and shit like he does funny ass like uh he does like really like uh whack comedy sketch content like idubs like uh filthy frank like sam hyde uh he's does he does like whack sketch comedy shit like real funny shit but he like adds the skater spin to it and he was on like zillicami's live and shit like there's certain people whose lives are always funny as shit like back on six nine his lives are always hilarious because he's just ripping into people god i but i saw six nine go live i think i've only joined his live once and it was like pretty close to when he got out of jail or like when he got his, all of his social media back yeah and oh my god the amount of people that were in that hoe. oh one, my one, god 1.2 million or some shit yeah, it was something crazy. But I think it was to the point where, like, they couldn't allow everyone to comment or else, like, it would literally, like, break. So I think they were only letting verified accounts comment. Um, so, but, I mean, even that, it was still, like, the comments were, like, lit up and there was all verified people. And it was like, holy shit. Bro. Yeah, like, um, Drake's comment section, not on his live, but on his account, is only people that he follows, you know what I'm saying? Uh yeah, that could be it too. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Although I don't think six nine follows anybody, or or I think he follows one person, and it's like uh, academics. Academics, yeah. Oh my god, I love academics, bro. What a like, goof. He's fucking bro. Like he I've been. Star <laughs> he I've been on the oh, like I've been fucking with academics in like the glory days. You know, like when Meek Mill and Drake were beefing. Like those days, you know what oh, I mean? Oh okay, that yeah true. Bro, you know what's yeah, crazy he was about cool Ac back then, but I don't know. He, at this point, like I feel like he's fighting real hard to stay, you know, to stay like relevant. I guess like people know who he is and everything, but I feel like he starts a lot of fights kind of like unnecessarily. Yeah. But um, what's crazy about him is he has fan pages of fan like fan pages of him that have more followers than um like most rappers you know what i mean like he has a fan page called chat and where you know what i'm saying that's what it's called like grand wizard or some shit and they'll be like they'll be like um fan pages of him and they have these massive followings where they post like their own original like meme content and, like it's just weird ass community you know what i'm saying like there's certain communities that i don't understand does that make like the bts community does that make sense yeah yeah it's you're for sure it's it's weird because it's like how the hell does that grow you know what i'm saying like where does that start from um but yeah well uh, academics like on the low makes music right like as little ak or something like that yeah yeah it's like it's like it, it, it's it's okay i mean it's it's kind of whack <laughs> but i mean like he's popular so somebody's gonna listen to it I think him, him and six nine probably made a track at some. They point. did, yeah, yeah. Like that's yeah, actually um. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I do not follow that fool anymore though. Like I not I never followed him on Instagram, but just in general, like I don't know. He uh, he's just always kind of been like a goof. 
kind of like a Jake Paul vibe, like where he, he kind of knows he's hated and he embraces it and almost like feeds into that, you know? Well, you knew someone who knew Jake Paul, right? I, I knew like, yeah. So like my brother, he knew some people who were from Westlake, which is where the Paul brothers were from. And, uh, they were like, I don't know, they were within a couple of years. So like they went to school with the Paul brothers while they were still at Westlake. And like, they did not have good things to say about them. Um, like they yeah. just kind of like, they ragged on everybody. Like they were just, they were as ignorant as they are now. And like, if not more because they were high school kids. I could, the, what I would say about, um, Logan is his podcast is good. He has a really yeah, good podcast, and he, like, makes good that's content. That's what I've heard, yeah. He, Logan is definitely kind of, like, in a better spot now than Jake is now. Like, Jake, I don't think, has really changed. He's almost gotten worse over the past, like, ever since Logan started improving. Ever since, like, the Floyd fight, and ever since he's been winning all these boxing matches, it's like, I don't know, his ego keeps getting bigger, and it's just like, damn, bro. Yeah, like, really like um, from Ohio, but I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, and you know, it was also crazy about the state that you're from. Is Trippy Red's from there? Canton, yeah, it's where my, uh, it's where my grandparents were from. <laughs> yeah, which I was kind of crazy because, like, Canton, like, when I found out that Trippy was from Canton, it made a lot of sense. <laughs> like, I don't what know, do people from Canton are just like, they're just kind of like out there. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's Canton's kind of like. It's kind of like a random city, you know what I'm saying? Like it's just kind, of, but it's big, so I don't know. Like, like the fact that Trippy was from Canton, it kind of just made sense to me. Like he just kind of like fit the bill or like fit the, fit the city well. Yeah, Trippy Red's okay. I uh, I think he's unique. I uh, I haven't really listened to a whole lot of his newer stuff, but I think he's cool. Like I I never really, I thought that whole beef with Six Nine that he had was kind of funny. I, I, <laughs> Yeah. I like I enjoy tuning into that every once in a while back when they were you know going live like talking shit to each other. I think what's cool like he um he gives me hella like the way his career will be will be very similar to Lil Wayne's where he kind of just raps on anything like he has his own style but he kind of just raps on anything and he's gonna not stop you know what I mean and he has a good work ethic and he's also really hit or miss like not every Lil Wayne song hits you know what i'm saying like even though lil wayne's fire like, i don't know do you l listen to lil wayne a lot oh yeah yeah lil wayne that's like i low-key grew up on lil wayne like yeah like grade school type shit when <laughs> playing like like mrs officer and fireman and amelie like those real like og shits president carter like and I the think early drake collabs oh yeah i mean those are all fire like lil wayne like He's just so goaded at this point that, like, he really can't put out a bad verse. Like, he's just kind of like, it's, yeah, it's very similar to Drake where, like, if you get a Drake feature, like, that song is probably going to pop off. You know what I'm saying? Like, just because it's Drake and everybody knows who that is. Same thing with Lil Wayne, you know? Yeah. Lil Wayne's been killing shit for a long-ass time. Or he's been rapping since he was, like, 11 years old or some shit. Bro, and, like, his old... I don't know if you go to, like, his old videos. Like, you can find probably, like, a look up 12-year-old Lil Wayne rapping. It's pretty good. He goes hard, yeah. He goes hard, yeah. Yeah. But There's a, uh, um, I'm trying to think of my favorite Wayne album. Probably, damn, that's tough. Because, like, each of them kind of have a different, like, like, I'm Not a Human Being was kind of, like, low-key punk inspired and, like, I don't know. I'd say President Carter, or, or not President, uh, the Carter 3 is probably one of my favorite albums by him. Mine's a Carter 4. four. Yeah, Carter 3 and 4. Oh, Carter man. 4 Deluxe. Carter 4 Deluxe. The Because uh, it has the um, up, up, and away. <laughs> like some, yeah, that was a, yeah, that was the, That, tight. like, that annoying synths that they use in that, these synths in that were really annoying in a way that i like you know what i mean we're like they're they bring Catchy. you back you know and, yeah. and some music critic which i happen to be a music critic but like a majority of music critics that would listen to that album including carter three they would be like it didn't age well like bro i don't care bro like i don't care yeah. like the the grand like that's why like people shit on graduation by kanye because like of the sense that he used 
and they say it didn't age well. Like I, I don't care. Like I'm this it's fire. It's kind bro. of a goaded album though. Like I I feel like even if you don't like the graduation album, you at least have to respect it for what it is. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't know. I, like a lot of people hate on Kanye because of how like how much of like a loose cannon he is and just kind of like how he just kind of says shit with no filter or whatever. But at the same time, like, you know, as goofy as he is, he's like, he's kind of a legend, like in terms of like all of his albums from college dropout, which was what, like 2005 or I'm not exactly sure the number, but some, somewhere in the two thousands up to now, every album has a different like theme or like genre or like kind of like style like graduation was super like kind of like space inspired and like college dropout was more like like soul inspired and yeezus was like crazy electronic and yeah, like, like even like my fantasy was like super like i mean that one's that's probably one of my favorite uh kanye albums my beautiful dark twisted fantasy there's a lot of good songs on that one I would say about Kanye is my favorite project. So I've kind of, what I do, I had this probably conversation every two weeks with one of my homies um, because like we were really, we love Kanye and shit. Um, a lot to talk about for sure. My favorite project by him would be tied, or two projects that are tied for my favorite, that would be Graduation and Yeezus are tied for my favorite because Yeezus, man, like, the sense crazy shit on there, yeah. It's fucking nuts. Like it's nuts, yeah. Like but I, on the leaves, by far has gotta be one of the craziest tracks he's released. Yeah, one of the best um Maho is, drops, you know. Yeah. Watch the thrones overlooked because people just like see the, the couple singles from it, like Otis and Paris, they like see that. And see, just, like, I didn't even like those are good songs, but I'm not gonna lie, I like the other ones more. Like, like what you need, uh, like that one, the yeah. what you need joint, and the uh, there's a Frank Ocean one on there, the uh, no church in the wild, that shit. Yeah, that was the first. I think that was one of the first songs I heard off that album. Like I, I probably heard, uh, I probably heard Otis first, and uh, I can't remember if Gold Diggers on that. The Gold Diggers uh, on uh, late registration. Oh okay, damn. Kanye has a ton of music. <laughs> yeah, but um. Uh, yeah, that was that was just, that's a sick song. No church in the wild. You know what that brings me back to talking about no church in the wild. Like a certain thing that I that I'm thinking of when it comes to that song is how songs like back then they used to be like all like good like a majority of the big charting tracks like not just rap but pop over four minutes. Yeah. Yeah, you know sure. what I'm saying like. Sure. I miss that. Like I miss that honestly. Like I miss when tracks like they were like I'm not saying all music nowadays is amateur, but the way it's done is very amateur because a majority of popular stuff now is independently produced. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or it's well, inspired now, like, by that. Like you'll be lucky if you get a, a top chart song that's over like two and a half or three minutes now. Like, yeah, yeah, for like, sure. I feel like this generation, like, or, you know, me included, um, is, like, the attention span is so quick now. Like, TikTok, one-minute videos, you know, like, even, like, Vine, seven-second videos, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just so quick, like, you know, people just kind of get, like, they lose interest after two minutes. You know even Joe saying? Rogan podcast, people would rather watch the clip that's five minutes long Yeah, the rather actual than the episode. I'm on, I'm on some different shit, because I, I, like... I love like, you know, my favorite Joe Rogan episodes are like five hours. You know what I mean? Like that's my like type Alex of. Alex Jones and the, you know. Yeah, like uh, Eddie Bravo, Duncan there. Trussell. Yeah. yeah, or Tim Dillon. Tim Dillon's funny. Bro, Tim Dillon, bro. And he has his own podcast. He's a goofball, bro. Dude, my favorite, did you see, he does skits on his YouTube too, and they're hilarious. The, uh, he does oh, it. yeah, I have seen some of those. Yeah, they're pretty funny. I might have showed you one, but the Senator in the Woods skit. Yeah, I probably have seen it. Yeah, my uh, my roommate was super into Tim Dillon, so he'd have him just playing in our house a lot. Tim Dillon's but, like uh, people at work know, know about him. Like a lot of people know about him because like he's like um, I think he gets a like like he um, a lot of people can connect with him like like about like uh political shit because he doesn't 
cross the line, but he does cross the line. Does that make sense? Well, like he intentionally crosses the line knowing that he's not being serious. You know what I'm saying? And like whether people take him serious, that's up to them. But he knows he's not being serious, so he can kind of just say whatever. Like I think that's kind of like where his humor is like based. You know what I'm saying? Like he just kind of like makes jokes and just doesn't really care the outcome of them because he yeah, knows yeah, that like, he's like, joking. You know? He just did a segment on Joe Rogan about the View. Um, the View that 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 cha- you know you're familiar with the show The View. Yeah, it's like uh, old old yeah. old um old ladies talk about politics. Yeah, yeah. And sure. so what he said is, uh, he, what he was said on Joe Rogan, he was like, there's so much intelligent women on the planet. None of them are on the view. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my grandma herself actually watches the view. So that, uh, that, that, that hit the core. That was like, yeah, like I, I, that, that show, like, I don't know, just certain shows that like, like on cable, like just cable produced stuff. And where I'm just looking at it, I'm like. How the fuck is Ellen still running? Like it's garbage, bro. Amazing. Like it's, isn't Ellen under fire right now though? Didn't she do something or she didn't do something specific. She just like she just apparently like didn't treat her like employees that nice. Uh okay. Yeah, I heard some uh some some bad publicity about Ellen, which is kind of surprising because like on TV she's like like everyone loves Ellen, you know what I'm saying? Like she's just kind of like she's Ellen. you know what i'm saying like she's funny she's super you know outgoing has a personality and all that but at the same time it kind of makes sense like why those people who it's their job to be like personable why they're not personable off camera you know what i'm saying like when it's your job to be friendly like when it when you're not on the clock it's almost like you know being friendly is like you're working and it's like you know that's not what you want to do when you're when you're taking a break or something. Yeah, like, I'm just, I can get that. I'm not saying it makes it any better, but like I can understand why you know she might not be friendly to people like her employees. I'm honestly like scared for when this becomes a job. Yeah, I, but I think it's one of those things where it won't feel like a job. You know what I'm saying? Like the more you do it, the more you kind of like start to enjoy it, and like you know you kind of like look forward to it instead of you know just thinking about it, like okay i gotta do you know this this and that like you know just to like make a buck or something like that like you can more just say like you know i'm looking forward to doing these interviews you know over the next week or like you know i'm looking forward to like listening to all this new music you know what i mean because i feel like it gets, it's an interesting um like i can imagine joe rogan probably has a blast like like doing that podcast you know what i'm saying like yeah i was gonna bring up something about okay. him like he yeah the early episodes were done you know let me describe to you like the career of joe rogan because i kind of talked about with someone else a little bit but what happened with him is he um like he was a big stand-up comedian in like the mid 2000s so what happened with him uh which really took a turn for his career is there was a comedian named by it goes by the name of carlos mencia a comedian the comedian carlos mencia at the uh, comedy store in la he uh, he uh he basically stole a bunch of Joe Rogan's friends' jokes. So what Joe Rogan did is he got his friend Brian Redband, um, to who did a lot of video content for Joe. Joe. What Joe Rogan did is he went on stage and roasted the fuck out of Carlos Mencia, and it went viral. It went like on in like or late late two thousand I think it was like two thousand eight two thousand nine ish, I think two thousand eight two thousand seven, around that time. And it went viral, this, like, video of Joe Rogan roasting the fuck out of Carlos Mencia and be like, you're stealing all my friends' jokes, woo, 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 right? And then what happened to Joe is he got kicked from the comedy store, and he was essentially blacklisted from the comedy industry because he exposed one of the biggest comedians. So what he did is he became, like, a really independent creator and did it, like, he had his own shows set up, but he couldn't go to, like, the heart of L.A., the biggest store there. So what he ended up doing is um after this hit this this smashdown on his career he started the podcast like on tour on on his shit in like the middle of a hotel room it was actually Christmas night 2009 and like back when he was doing like Fear Factor and shit <laughs> yeah like like he was he was Get a hair. yeah like I think he was actually done 
fear factor at the time, but the point is like he was real independent with it because and he did it. He didn't even get his first sponsor because this is like right when podcasts started existing. He didn't even get his first sponsor until like a couple hundred episodes in, and it didn't even go on all like Spotify or any of that shit or like on YouTube until like two hundred episodes in. It was like live streamed to Ustream or some shit. Oh man! Like 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 in oh. um. Like, man, dude, like, that's, like, it just shows how, like, a lot, like, the the butterfly effect, just how this shit started, you know what I mean? Yeah, no doubt, and he's got a ton of episodes out. Like, I think he's, like, he's passed a thousand episodes, like, kind of a while ago at this point. He just did a Tarantino episode. He interviewed Quentin Tarantino. Oh, I gotta watch that. Yeah, I know he did talk about some cool shit. My, uh, my buddy said he watched it, and he said they were talking about, like, Kill Bill and, like, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and... You know, he dropped the book of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, like a book novel version of the film. Um, I'm saving a lot of money right now. I'm not going to buy that, but I'm, it's cool that he's doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like like dropping books yeah, and shit. Like, sure. And when he stops making films, because he's stopping at 10, Tarantino, he's, gonna drop, he's dropping his 10th movie, then he's going to stop making films. He said he's gonna write like plays and novels, you know, like that's what I hear. Like, what Tarantino films do you fuck with? Um, so I really like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I know that's like one of his newer ones, but oh my god, that movie was so well put together. He got like, like Brad Pitt. That's like Brad Pitt, like in some of his best acting. Like <laughs> that was so crazy. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, there's some other Tarantino movies besides Kill Bill. Cause I, I like a lot of Tarantino movies. It's just, I'm a, I'm probably a bigger fan of Martin Scorsese. Bro, oh fuck, bro, we're yeah, about to go Martin in. Scorsese. We're about to go down that rabbit hole. We're about oh shit. Oh man, like every movie that that dude puts out is just amazing. And um, the work Good, uh, ethic you know, has not stopped. Irishman. Yeah. Oh, uh, Taxi Driver. Yeah, like bro, he's been doing shit since the '60s, bro. Yeah, and like he was in Taxi Driver. I didn't even realize that until like I looked into it when I was watching. Yeah, he was the uh, the guy who was like in the back of the 40, cab. What would a forty four Magnum do to a woman's pussy? What would a forty four Magnum do, got to, do to a woman's pussy? Yeah, yeah, bro. He's like, are you listening to me? No, don't say anything. No, wait, we'll say something to me. No, don't say anything. Like you're just crazy, dude. Yeah, and then you find out that like like he might like he might not even been there the entire time. Like that might have just been like. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was Travis. Yeah, it might have been just like Travis, like, like imagining it because he hadn't gotten to sleep in like three days or something like that. Is that like a theory? Yeah, yeah. Like, cause I think like the overarching like kind of like theme of Taxi Driver is that he's like a schizophrenic and an insomniac. Yeah, but there's also I mean, a um seeing like the movie through his eyes kind of thing. There's also a connection to the modern day incel community and how it's about like, it's like a movie about incels before incels existed. Oh, damn. If that Does that make sense? Like, like where it's about like the, the lonely, the lonely man and how a man deals with loneliness and how a man that is lonely is a dangerous man. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. I guess I didn't think about it that way. What I hate, though, I is, like, the way Joker was... dick it off of that movie. Like, Joker really dick it off of that movie. And I gen- I'm gonna, I've said this a million times. You know, by the way, Taxi Driver poster right there. But Oh, um, I, oh that's hard. Yeah, fuck yeah. But, uh, by the way, I might have said this a million times, but I fucking, like, I just don't like Joker. I really hate it. Like, I don't know. Like the movie The Joker? Yeah. Did you like uh, Heath Ledger when he was in The Dark Knight? Oh, fuck yeah. Like, like, oh, uh, yeah, okay, bad. Yeah. He is the spirit of anarchy. You know, that's. Oh, yeah, I don't got And, like, the reason I fuck with, like, his performance in that is because, like, that's a, um. That's a side of a lot of people, you know what I'm saying? Or a certain type of person, a very like, anti systematic person, role. you like, know what I mean? Yeah, he, like, transformed himself into that role. Yeah, Heath Ledger is kind of a goat. You know what I really like uh, a film uh, with him would be the fucking the fucking uh, it was a Disney flick, Ten Things I Hate About You. That is a banger, bro. You you familiar with that movie? I don't think I've seen it, but I've definitely heard of it. Yeah. 
Oh, that's like a um. So what happened? What what's the center of the movie? And you might a lot of people might think this is some corny shit, but I fucking I love romantic comedies. Anyways, um, uh, but yeah. it's like there's two <laughs> sisters, like two really hot sisters in this high school, and then the um one of the guys is like one sister can only date if the other sister dates. Does that like uh, basically it's about like these guys it's just like all about it's just some romance about these guys that want to date this girl so they got to get a guy to date this girl so they could date another girl and like it's just a it's just a funny ass movie like uh and it's like um i just love like what like disney type of shit do you like does that make sense like you could say like mean girls even though it's not disney but what type of like high school oriented movies do you fuck with Damn, let me see. Um, cause I've definitely seen quite a bit of those. I really like uh, probably one of my favorite movies ever is uh, Breakfast Club. Fuck yeah. Yeah, that shit goes hard. Um, I remember the first time I watched it, I was almost like, I don't know. I had never seen a movie with that kind of plot line before. Like where it was like, like literally the set was like a high school in a library and that was it. You know what I'm saying? Like there wasn't really a whole lot more to it. I'm going to talk to you about the director on that because the director of that did a bunch of movies that you probably really fuck with. Um, 16 Candles, I know it's one of them that's really good. I haven't seen it, but I, I have been meaning to yeah, see it. Yeah, John Hughes. John Hughes, yeah. He was like, he did a bunch of those movies around the time he did The Breakfast Club. Yeah, he was a really, really big deal at the time. But, damn, I, I'm not really sure, like, Disney shit. Like, I don't know. I don't really, like... I watch a lot of movies. Like, I've watched a decent amount of movies up to this point, but, like, I probably listen to more music than I watch things. Like, I probably like watching shows low-key better. What show? What shows do you fuck with? So, right now, I'm watching Shit's Creek. It's on Netflix. Oh, man. I didn't think I was going to like that. And, like, for the first few episodes, it's a little bit of a slow start. But, like, I don't know, but I just, I really like the, the, um, the actors and actresses in Shit's Creek. They got a really, really good cast. Back on They're The Breakfast nice. Club, what's awesome about that movie, and I discussed with my friend Hannah, uh, Hannah Dallas, shouts out to her. Um, I discussed with her is about how, like, I might have discussed with someone, I don't know who the fuck I discussed with. I'd be confusing the fuck out of people I talk to because I talk to so many fucking people. Anyways, oh, yeah. <laughs> but realistically, at the end of the movie, like, if they did a sequel, the people that were in the uh, detention together, they would not say hi to each other in school on Monday. Yeah. Yeah, isn't... Oh, oh that's right. That's right. Yeah, that would be a good end to it. But, like, don't... Like, if you actually think about it, like, due to their uh, specific niche friend groups, quote-unquote... They would, um, it's just, they kind of still have to just like kind of go back to normal. And that's like, uh, it, I talked to you with my friend Lauren oh, Lepre yeah, about shit and how like in the summer, whenever you're in the summer, you think that like before the school starts again, you're going to get your nice clothes, you're going to lose weight and then you go to school again and then you realize it's really just back to normal and nothing changes, even though you get all these new clothes and uh to make it feel different even though it really not shit's different either. like the people that watch the breakfast club probably get the same feeling when they watch uh, ferris bueller's day off is like they have like an existential crisis yeah the dude with the ferrari oh man my heart hurts every time i see that ferrari just fall out of that window <laughs> yeah bro what movies like, oh, like what do you say I do like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That is a good movie. Yeah. Uh, what, like, other movies, like, this is a loaded question, but what movies give you, like, an existential crisis? Low-key Taxi Driver made me feel something different after I watched it. Because I kind of looked at it as, like, like, you were watching the movie through his eyes, and once you realize that, like, the whole movie kind of just, like, seems different. So that was crazy. Psycho, the original Psycho, that is crazy, bro. I didn't know how that ended when I first went into it. That's me. I won't spoil it, but like the end of Psycho is very, very crazy. <laughs> um, and for like being made in like the fifties or sixties or whatever it was, that hoe is crazy. Oh, now we're talking about like real old movies. I got one. Letter from an unknown woman. Ooh, that sounds good. 
you want to hear the about what this one's about? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm going full spoilers because I really like I don't give a fuck like. Right, no, no, no. But um, so this movie, this girl, it's like set in Vienna, Australia. It's like late forties, nineteen forty seven. Uh, directed by Max Opals, and you can look at anybody can watch this on YouTube for free. Just look up "Letter from an Unknown Woman." It's like a good hour and a half or whatever. And this girl, uh, she's obsessed with this piano player that's like her neighbor, and she's like really like into him and stuff like that. And um, she like really, she really like wants to like be with him, but her family is moving soon, so the mom's getting them to move and stuff like that. So she moves. Right before she moves to another town, you know, with her parents, she uh she like does this one night stand with this uh with this guy, right? And then as she's like in another town and shit, she like uh fuck. She she like she's her mom tries to get her to marry someone else and stuff like that. But then she realizes I think she realizes she's pregnant or some shit. And she's pregnant with the one night stand guy. And the pianist is like this really rich piano player and stuff like that. So she doesn't. So the piano player doesn't really acknowledge this girl or anything like that. So she's stuck with this baby. And then there's a typhus, some disease outbreak in Europe. So then and then the uh, kid like grows up. And seven years later, uh, like the kid, uh, they, they grow up and stuff like that. And they're about to die from this like disease. And, like, on her deathbed, she, like, writes this letter about their, like, one-night stand and how much she loved it and misses him. And then he's, at the end, and the whole movie is him reading this letter, like, and, and, and um, you know, with flashbacks and stuff like that. Oh, shit. And it's, like, showing what really happened. And at the end of it, you know, she dies. And it's, like, it it hit the emotions, man. Like, yeah, for sure. Like, and it's, like, this really European movie, man. Like, that's... Cause um, how do I? I forget. I did a video about this movie because I loved it so much. But it's like about how much they wished things would have worked out. You know what I mean? Like that's those good romance movies when like everything doesn't work out. Like Titanic, man. That's a good fucking movie where everything does that's not work sad. out. Like, yeah, that ending is very sad. But that's why I love it. You know, like in um. I fucking love Titanic, man. Like, I think James Cameron should have stopped making movies after Titanic. Like, I don't give a fuck about Avatar. Like, I really don't care about Avatar. Like, I don't even know how that made so much money at the box office. Like, I think it was, like, the production value of it. Like, that was pretty new. That was pretty revolutionary at the time when Avatar came out. I remember that. Like, the effects and everything, like... Yeah. I remember that was pretty state-of-the-art at the time. So, I think, like... People wanted to see that, like people wanted to see how far movies could go in terms of like effects and shit. Yeah, like I get it, and like, cause now you look at movies like Infinity War, that make Avatar look like an old movie. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, bro. <laughs> Infinity War is a bop, though. Like honestly, that fucking that one. I've seen a, a lot of the other Avengers, but I haven't seen that one yet. I've heard it's pretty good though. It's very melancholy. Yeah. Studio film, you know what I mean? It's literally built to be good. It's built to make money, so like you're probably gonna like it. You know what I mean? Well, it's like um, it's really melancholy. Like, it's real sad because like everyone likes superheroes. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just a cool concept. Well, do you want to know like about the villain and shit, or do you gonna watch it? You, you're probably not gonna well, watch it. Like I'm not gonna like the uh, the villain is Robert California from The Office. I thought that was kind of funny. So Thanos is he uh he lived on a planet. Where there was economic turmoil and there's like some big war that happened and he's like one of the only people left from his race of titans or some shit or fucking basically what happens is he grew up in a shitty planet and uh he saw the uh reason for the economic turmoil from his planet as overpopulation so his plan is to get all the infinity stones um which are like elements of the universe and shit and he's gonna uh snap his fingers and he's gonna kill half of the universe's population to make um to like depopulate the world because he thinks that like uh you know like overpopulation is a big problem for uh, you know society and he, he thinks like he really believes in himself and he like 
he like he like he kills his daughter in the movie to like win and shit. Like it's like a really fucking. It's like a movie not about the Avengers. It's about Thanos. You know what I'm saying, and that's why I like it. And honestly, it's my favorite Avengers movie because it's a Thanos movie, and uh. All, and the Avengers lose at the end of the movie, and then they, you know, they win in the next movie, which I didn't really care. Like, I think Endgame was a fun movie, but I like, I like a sad, I like sad movies, man. I, I'm not afraid to admit it, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's cool because like the fact that directors and the people who make those movies can like tug at your heartstrings and like make you like really like. I don't know, like, buy the characters and, like, their scenarios and everything. Because, like, I took a class in um, in college. It was, like, a, uh, it was, like, like, history on film, I think it was called. And it was basically, like, how the movies of that time reflected, like, that the year that they were in and, like, the, like, society and how it was going. Yeah. And, like, I don't know, but it kind of makes you look at movies in a different light and, like, you know why they're being made and like what you know like what the directors had in mind because everything like everything like the, that is in the movie is there for a reason taxi driver post vietnam war you know exactly exactly he always wears the army coat you know what i'm saying like you know these things aren't on accident you know what i'm saying like everything in a movie is like done for a reason so the fact that like directors can make like kind of like make you feel a certain way is like pretty amazing to me yeah and like really the what i love about scorsese is he's good at tackling eras you know he's really good at tackling an era of time like casino which is probably my favorite tarantino film is casino really Uh, what scorsese yeah scorsese yeah yeah. like you know irishman tackles an era um, or like it's really like his movies are grand but um they're very modern at the same time which is really interesting how he makes every character memorable and how like everything is memorable, but it's like really modern. And usually like when you think of memorable characters, a majority of the time people think of like a really fictional thing because they think that if something's fictional, then the characters are more memorable. But what he does is he like, he does the similar Tarantino does the same thing where he makes people like, he makes his characters like really memorable, is what I'm saying. When they're just kind of normal people, it's little takes or like something that it's like, why do they do that? You know what I'm saying? Like, like in um, in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, what's his name? Yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio's character, like he's a real bad smoker, and like the dude coughs throughout the entire movie, and actually like his condition gets worse as the movie goes on. Like that little detail gives him personality trait that's like you said it's memorable but it's like little things like that you know what i'm saying like it's all on purpose like it's they don't just like say oh yeah that'd be funny if you were a smoker like they know what they're doing you know what I mean? yeah you know what once upon a time in hollywood did is they put me down a fucking rabbit hole of mm, charles manson conspiracy theories and <laughs> me too i might have told you that i may have but I fucking I read a book called Chaos uh, about uh, Charles Manson's involvement with the mind control program and the CIA and how like um he was a the theory the theory is he was an MK Ultra experiment gone right. Oh shit. Does that make sense? Well, what's that? What's MK Ultra? Mind control. Oh shit! See, I don't know. That's that seems a little out there for me. Like, I don't know if I could buy into. That. I think it's a combination of what people know and that. Does that make sense? Because there is a complex play. There's a there's a uh, what do they call it? A uh, hate Ashbury. It's called a a clinic. Yeah, it's a clinic called the Hate Ashbury Clinic in the San Francisco area. And what what they did is they're like a bunch of scientists and. That are involved in the government, and uh, some scientists there were involved in the MK Ultra program. And what they would do is they would just like, they would let it be like a little hotel for hippies. You know what I'm saying? They would just get hippies in there, and they would just like write shit about them. The the, the famous uh, study on them is called the Journal of Psychedelics by the Haight Ashbury Clinic, 
and they'd essentially just let a bunch of fucking loser like hippies that just smoked a lot of weed and now they're not losers because they smoke weed but like homeless people they would essentially let a bunch of like sort of castaway people come in and they'd just study them they'd use them as lab rats and shit like that so and you know one of those people who uh was charles manson and shit so like charles manson was like consistently going in and out of this like government facility and shit i don't know there's a lot of scat like what conspiracy theories have you gotten into like in general Ooh, um i feel like i've talked about a lot of them because me and my roommate used to talk like conspiracies like for hours yo I'm trying to think. It's always I, I say Area 51 is the one that bothers me the most. Like I really want to see go to Area 51 and see what it looks like. From quote unquote insider sources, apparently you can see the curvature of the Earth from there. That's how big it is. That's what I'm saying, bro. Like I want to I want to be in Area 51, bro. I want to see what's good. Like there was one dude. Um, his name was Bob Lazar. He actually went on Joe Rogan. He was talking about, so he used to work for a base at Area 51. Like, it was, I mean, it was called something different, like Area something, but it was, like, within, like, the, the boundaries of Area 51. So, he worked on the prom. Ned Bundy talked about uh, shit on my podcast Ned relating Bundy to... Intellectually tapped in, <laughs> for sure. Because <laughs> he's in New Mexico, so he's kind of, uh, he's aware of certain things that related to me not uploading that episode yeah yeah no doubt bro that's the yeah, guy that's the geyser though that's that's um like edward snowden said who also was on jerogan <laughs> hey bro they, they can listen whenever they want you know what i'm saying like it's just a matter of if they want to okay i think we should talk about this because i was gonna talk about this with someone else what are you aware of john mcafee vaguely <laughs> okay here we go bro all right, uh, antivirus software. You have it downloaded in your computer, most likely, maybe not, or you're aware of a software called McAfee Software. It is. It, 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 oh it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know he made yeah. that. He that's ever. the first ever antivirus software ever. All right. Right. Makes a lot of money off this software. Uh, you know becomes like a really um reclusive person he kind of detached from like society and stuff like that like later down the you know line post 90s basically and he would like he she was he was a pretty wild figure and um he died now like a couple days a couple weeks ago uh supposed suicide because he was very um he was he's very like outspoken about like a lot of shit relating to like uh he, he like he, he was on some Snowden shit like what happened is someone killed someone killed his uh dog and, and shit that was in um he killed his neighbor and shit because his neighbor killed his dog or some shit and there's a bunch of shit where he like d- donated a bunch of computers to the government but laced them with like spyware and figured out that like the government was like running human trafficking and drug rings in like Latin America. So like he had a bunch of information and shit on the government and shit. And he and basically what people are saying is John McAfee didn't Epstein himself. That's the thing that people are saying is that he didn't kill himself, that he was killed. But I don't know, bro. Like I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like what do you yeah. think of the Epstein situation as well? Do you think he killed himself? I don't know. I think it's what people want to believe, so they're gonna to try to make a case for it. Um, I don't think there's really any way to tell, but low key with what that dude did, like, I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. But but at the same, well, and actually no, maybe because that, that's what they said happened, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I low key like maybe because. People want to believe that, um, you know, the conspiracy. They want to believe that about what they didn't say. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I don't know. Personally, I, I think there's really no way to prove it. Yeah, I think with like a lot of these a- shits, it's always like a uh, 
There's no definitive answer, and people should sort of shut the fuck up and find comfort in, like, not knowing. And that's why, like, I sort of like to spread this message is treat conspiracies like uh, this book right here, this little fantasy book. You know what I mean? Like, or, uh, you know, treat it like a ancient Greek culture, like some shit may or may not have happened. Like, was there fucking Cyclops running around on Greek? I mean, on Greece, probably, maybe not. Who knows? You know what I mean? They could have been wiped out. They could have been like some genetic mutation, and there could have actually been Cyclops on, you know, on Greece lands or whatever the fuck. Um, But like, we'll never fucking know. Right. There's no way to tell exactly. So it's like you can harp on it all day and talk what ifs, but like. You know, there's not, there's never gonna be like a like a evidence or anything like that. So, but it's yeah. cool to entertain sometimes. Like, what if? You know what I'm saying? Like, that would be pretty badass if they're like real cyclops at one point. Yeah, I talk. I like the fucking. What's cool? One of the most coolest conspiracies is the hollow earth theory. Have you heard of that? No, I have. I've heard of the flat earth theory. That one's kind of funny. I fucking hate that one, but. uh but let me oh. let me introduce you to Hollow Earth theory. They uh, I'm just gonna Wikipedia this shit for you because I'm I don't want to talk out of my ass. So the con the Hollow Earth theory is a concept proposing that the planet Earth is entirely hollow or contains substantial interior space. And basically, there is a you know a theory that there is underground civilizations and shit. Where, like, there is, uh, like, right before the uh, second layer of the Earth, like, right before the crust ends, there is, like, a, a, there's, like, a reverse gravitational land where people live. There, There's either an ancient civilization here, there's either the remains of an old civilization, or there's a bunch of, there's, like, a bunch of water down there. And there's a, the theory is that there is fucking a shit underground that we haven't checked out or people have uh, stopped us from checking it out. Haven't we drilled pretty far down the earth? Uh, I like, think I guess how though, like what's in the earth if we have it, you know what I'm saying? The, the theory, like the more like, um, like I feel like they, they know we have a, is they like drill and like figure that out somehow. You know what I'm saying? The theory is that right before you know how there's like, like you know how there's four layers of the earth. Yeah. The theory is right before the uh the one so we're on the crust and then there's the magma, I believe. Uh <laughs> I, I you know, the one before the next one. Like right yeah. in between that there's a little section. I think that the mantle is a layer somewhere. Yeah, like the theory is that right before the mantle there's a small pocket of water and uh like land in between that where there is life and there is a um admiral bird is let's go to admiral bird that's my favorite fucking shit to talk about admiral bird was a uh let's go let me let me look that up admiral bird so he apparently found an entrance to this land in the uh 40s and uh you know post world war ii and he found an entrance he went there documented his journeys and his documentation of this journey was heavily suppre- suppressed by the government it's actually in the 20s my bad and um yeah apparently he you know it was the 40 it was like the from the 20s to the 40s he did expeditions and apparently he found uh this land but his findings were heavily suppressed. Does that make sense? Wait, so he went underground? Yes, but he flew there through a fucking portal in the North or South Pole. I forget. I'm on... It sounds weird, but, you know, apparently this guy found some shit. And they didn't want him to say, to say anything about it. Yeah. That's weird, though. I wonder why. But, like, um... People don't, like, go there? Yeah, I don't know. Like, what would be what would be wrong with that? Yeah, like if I was president, I would like, I would, I would fucking, you know, what I'm saying, like, I would go there, you know. But I think the reason the government suppresses information is my Mason theory, is that uh, 
like if you were handed a space if you were handed the keys to a spaceship and someone was like you can go to mars now you would not make it to mars because you don't know what none of us know what the fuck we would be doing if we drove a spaceship to mars because we don't know how to use that technology you know what i mean right so if they disclosed a bunch of information about like oh we have a bunch of ufos oh we have a bunch of aliens here oh we have this that and the third we wouldn't know how to comprehend it and shit like that and that they're going to slowly distribute the information out i don't know but like even if it is too much to comprehend like what would be the effects of that you know what i'm saying like say they did come out and say like yeah area 51 studies extraterrestrial beings and objects and you know we've found some pretty shocking things and like you know obviously like that'll be a lot to take in but like at the same time it just is like just like anything else you know what i mean like covid like we all do adapt to covid when that happened you know what i'm saying yeah, that like, shit was like i'm gonna be honest bro that shit was light work like like adapting to that for me like i don't know like i i i it wasn't that hard. It was hard, but it wasn't that hard. The weirdest thing was probably school. That was probably the weirdest thing to adapt to. Was, um, yeah. For uh, sure. That shit was wild. The thing about uh, COVID was one of the most beautiful times was uh, April of that year. We went to... We didn't go anywhere. Never mind. But we were. I was at home, and I went to... I rode a bike on a highway and there was no cars on the highway. It was like about 3 a.m. I was riding my bike on the highway. No cars on the highway. It was some movie shit, you know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, it was great. so cool, man. It, it uh, felt like 28 days later, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, for real. Or like some like uh, Walking Dead type shit. Or like, uh... you ever seen The Walking Dead? I think I watched the first season. It was pretty good. No, I'm familiar with like, it being about zombie apocalypse shit, you know? Yeah. I really like, uh, this isn't really like zombies, but, um, I Am Legend. That movie. Yeah, was yeah, bro. That's fucking. That's a sick ass movie, bro. Like, I don't know. Like, it's just a cool idea. You know what I'm saying? Like, they make a cure for cancer, but like, they fuck it up. So only some people. Or they get this crazy mutation where, like, they're not even really, like, human anymore. Like, bro, that's insane. And he has to go there to, like, study it. Because <laughs> he can't leave, like, the, like, wherever he is. Like, the island where he is. Yeah, that's Wait, well, I'm confused. About, so, is there a part of that world where there is, like, real people alive and, like, doing normal yeah, shit? Yeah, I Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, like, that was kind of how the movie started, like... Like the the dad, so Will Smith, he like he had to stay behind to like do research and like just kind of like update everyone else like what the status of like that area is, I guess. Um, so, but he had to leave his family, so like he had to like his family went to wherever the disease wasn't like you know spreading or whatever, and then he stayed there, and. Uh, yeah, he, uh, so it's about him, like, kind of, like, just kind of learning how to survive. Or maybe he was, like, immune to it or something like that. I just remember he had to stay there for some reason. Um, so he was just kind of, like, learning how to live with his dog. That's dope. But yeah, it's, it's a really, really cool movie. In an attempt to genetically re-engineer the measles, I'm reading the Wikipedia, measles oh, virus to cure cancer becomes... To cure, it becomes lethal, infecting 99% of the world's population, turning those it doesn't kill into vampiric, albino, cannibalistic mutants called the Dark Secrets, who are vulnerable to sunlight and prey on the few who are left unaffected. Blah, blah, blah. Isolated. Okay. Yeah. So, Robert Neville, the character, yeah, he leaves an isolated life in the ruins of Manhattan. And, uh, but I miss that though. I miss, uh, the, uh, the, uh, feeling of the world going to shit. Yeah. Like, I miss, don't you miss that? Like, bro. Yeah, oh, definitely. It was fun. It was a fun There's little a lot movie. Of good movies about that. They're just kind of old at this point. Yeah, like, I honestly, like, 
and bro, like I fucking live in, like not in the middle. I live like slightly in the middle of nowhere, but we have like my state doesn't even have a million people living in it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So like, I didn't see shit. Like I don't like I don't live in fucking Italy where like everybody died. Yeah. Like, yeah. For real. Like like shouts out to anybody who's listening to my shit in Italy, but like chances are like half of the people you knew are probably fucking dead. And like I feel, you know, I feel bad that that shit happened, but like I can't relate. And I had a, I honestly had a blast. Like it just made me make more fucking YouTube videos. <laughs> like, yeah. like, and I'm sounds yeah. that sounds really insensitive, but like I don't like I'm just. Are you talking about COVID? Yeah, bro. Oh, okay. I know. Yeah, it was bad, and like I think it was bad in the UK, and like I think Switzerland or Sweden or one of those places. I think Sweden or Switzerland or wherever the fuck they. Uh, it was they good. Tried, they tried the the hive mind. They tried the the herd effect or something like that, where they just said like, "All right, we'll all just get it so that we can get build antibodies and you know, like get over it fast." But it went it, good for a little bit, and then it tanked, and then it went south, and people started like dying a lot more. So I think they had to do restrictions again. But <laughs> yeah. I think, that, I think that was Sweden as far as I know. That's, I might be wrong. Though. Yeah, but I'm like, my opinion on is real like, I don't know, man. All I know is it helped, it helped me like know myself more, you know what I'm saying? And get focused. Yeah. Like, um, I, like and I don't let shit get to me. Like, bro, um, the amount of fucking people that were like, oh, man, COVID, I just can't get a job now. I got these COVIDs around, like, I don't, like, bro, it was like the heart, the heart of June, protests all around the country, fucking everything on the news burning, uh, I'm not saying any opinion about that, I'm just saying that's a fact, that there was a lot of protests yeah. around the country. Yeah, uh, that was a big deal, that, that, that made history, like, that was, that will be in history books. Diseases, yeah. diseases, and, and such. Yeah, I want to have gotten a fucking job at a tavern, I don't give a fuck, like, that's not gonna stop me from like making some bread, like you know what I'm saying. Like yeah. I'm, and I'm totally fine with that. Like, and, and I'm showing like, I'm saying like, don't let like the excuse of something that's happening like hundreds of thousands of miles away. Now there's never such thing as hundreds of thousands. Don't let shit that's happening thousands of miles away or hundreds of miles away like really affect like what the fuck you do with like your personal development. You know what I'm saying? Like people let shit get to them. Like people let shit affect them so much. Like. They're like, oh man, this person's president. I can't sleep comfortably. Yeah. Like that shit doesn't affect you that much. Definitely. Like it just kind of is the way it is sometimes. You can either sulk in it or you can just deal with it. You know what I mean? And try to get like make the most out of it. Cause like, what well, you know, like there's two ways to live. One is, you know, you can you know you hate waking up. But it's tough to go to sleep. You know what I mean? And the other one is you just kind of accepted it. And you're trying to make the most out of it, which is at least positive. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's facts, bro. Uh, we we did a good hour. We did a good hour, and thanks for coming on the show, bro. Stick yeah, on, really stick great. on after I'm done recording. Do you have anything you'd like to announce before we wrap this episode up? Uh, yeah, I guess really quick. Uh, dropping a self-produced EP this Friday. It's called Odyssey. Um, it's gonna be four tracks, uh, no features. Um, so I would appreciate if you could check that out. Uh, other than that, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it as always. Fuck yeah, bro. And talk to you soon. I'm gonna call you on Instagram after this shit. Goodbye. Good looks.